Dividend discount models are one of the easiest ways to value a company that pays a dividend. Typically, the only cash you receive from a stock is its dividend. The simplest way to value that equity is with this model or formula. The general model. When an investor buys a stock, they expect cash flows in two areas. One is with the current and future dividend payments. The other is the increase in value of the company during the time period is being held. Since the value of the stock is determined by the future value of the dividends, the value of the dividends is its current price growing through infinity. The formula is as follows. V equals DPS divided by R minus G, where DPS or dividend per share is the expected dividend one year from now. R is required rate of return for equity investors. G is the annual growth rate of the dividend forever. Don't worry, we'll go over all of these in depth. I will show you how to find these inputs and where to find the data to do these calculations. It is easy math, addition, division, and so on. Gordon Growth Model The dividend discount model is also known as the Gordon Growth Model. This formula was popularized by Myron Gordon in the 1960s. The formula was created in the 1930s by John Burr Williams and Robert Weiss. There are two formulas to help calculate the intrinsic value for a company paying dividends. The Gordon Growth Model is utilized for companies that are in a stable growth period and their dividends are growing at a steady rate. The other version is this two-stage dividend discount model. This formula has many more moving parts and is best for companies that are going through different stages of their growth. We will discuss this formula at another time. Stable Growth Rate While the Gordon Growth Model is a simple and powerful approach to value equity, its use is limited to firms that are growing at a stable rate, i.e. dividend aristocrats or kings. There are two insights worth keeping in mind when estimating a stable growth rate. First, since the growth rate is the firm's dividends is expected to last forever, the firm's other measures of performance, including earnings, can also be expected to grow at the same rate. To see why, consider the long-term consequences of a firm whose earnings grow 6% a year forever, while its dividends grow at 8%. Let's consider this for a moment. This is impossible in the real world, but in the laboratory, it needs to be considered. Over time, the dividends will exceed earnings. On the other hand, if a firm's earnings grow at a faster rate than dividends in the long term, the payout ratio in the long term will converge towards zero, which is also not a steadier state. Thus, though the model's requirement is for the expected growth rate in dividends, investors should be able to substitute in the expected growth rate in earnings and get precisely the same result if the firm is truly in a steady state. The second issue relates to what a growth rate reasonable as a stable growth rate. This growth rate has to be less than or equal to the growth rate of the economy in which the firm operates. This does not, however, imply that investors will always agree what this rate should be, even if they agree that a firm is a stable growth firm for these three reasons. Given the uncertainty associated with estimates of expected inflation and real growth in the economy, there can be differences in the benchmark growth rate used by different analysts, i.e. investors with higher expectations of inflation in the long term may project a nominal growth rate in the economy that is higher. The growth rate of a company may not be greater than that of the economy, but it can be less. Firms can become smaller over time relative to the economy. A growth rate larger than the economy would yield a negative numerator, which would give us a negative intrinsic value. There is another instance when an investor may stray from a strict limit imposed on the stable growth rate. If a firm is likely to maintain a few years of above stable growth rates, an approximate value for the firm can be attained by adding a premium to the stable growth rate to reflect the above average growth in the initial years. Even in this case, the flexibility that the investor has is limited. The sensitivity of the model to growth implies that the stable growth rate cannot be more than 1% or 2% above the growth rate of the economy. If the deviation becomes larger, the investor will be better served using a two-stage or three-stage model to capture the supernormal or above-average growth and restricting the Gordon growth model to when the firm becomes truly stable. Bottom line is that these modules can be very reliant on a steady growth rate and it cannot exceed the growth rate of the economy. If it does, it will not fit the model and you will get a negative intrinsic value. These formulas are designed for steady growing dividends, not the big high flyers of the stock market. The dividend discount model is a very simple and powerful tool to value company, but is it extremely sensitive to the inputs for growth rate. If inputted correctly, it can lead to wrong answers or absurdly wrong valuations, which can be deadly when investing. 
This brings up the point of never, ever buy a company simply because you get a number you like from one formula or valuation. This will lead to a loss of capital or worse, causing you to never invest again. What is the formula best for? This formula works best for companies growing at a rate comparable or lower than the growth rate of our economy. Additionally, companies that have a well-established dividend policy that they intend to continue into the future. The dividend payments are assumed to be thought of with stable companies, as they usually pay a stable growing dividend. These companies usually pay a substantial dividend that will grow over time. Think Coke, Johnson & Johnson, Colgate, and so on. Note, none of these are exciting, flashy stocks that are darlings of the stock market. They are usually associated with boring, staid companies. But these are the best companies to use for this formula, as it will give you a truer number. Types of businesses that are best suited for this formula include utilities, REITs, and stable dividend-paying companies. Okay, we've talked about the formula enough. Let's get to some examples so we can see how this works. First company we will select will be Johnson & Johnson. First, we'll need to gather a little background information to be able to start to plug into our formula. To find most of this info, I use gurufocus.com, which is a freemium site that allows you to gather the most recent data for our formula. All these numbers will be gathered on the 30-year financial data page. We will use TTM numbers or trailing 12 numbers as they will give us an average over the last 12 months if we don't have access to the most recent financial data. This will give us the closest numbers to use. Johnson & Johnson, EPS TTM equals $5.93. Dividends per share equals $3.36. The first step will be to determine the growth rate. There are many different formulas out there that help you determine this number. However, in the interest of keeping this as conservative as possible, we are going to use the nominal growth rate of the GDP of the U.S. The reason for this? As we stated earlier, you can't have a company growing faster than the U.S. economy or the formula won't work. If the growth rate is a larger number than the cost of equity, which we are going to calculate next, you will get a negative number. This will lead to an error in the calculations. Therefore, we use the nominal growth rate of the economy, which is a pretty conservative number. Remember, this formula is extremely sensitive to its inputs. Currently, the current Nominal growth rate of the GDP is 4.33%. Next, we're going to calculate the cost of equity. To do this, we're going to need to gather a little more info. Formula for cost of equity is as follows. Cost of equity equals the risk-free rate plus beta times market risk premium. So what are these terms? Simply put, the risk-free rate is the minimum rate that you should expect that you would earn on this investment, barring any growth at all. Basically, this is the least amount you would expect to make on this investment, and any less would be a disappointment. This number can be found through Professor Damodaran's website. He updates this rate every year. The risk-free rate is extremely difficult to calculate, and for our purposes here, it is far easier to get this from Professor Damodaran's website. Next up is beta. This is the expected volatility of the stock compared to the rest of the stock market. It is a very complicated formula to calculate this, and trust me, you don't want to go there. This means that any number below 1 is less volatile than the rest of the market, and above a 1 is more volatile. Lastly is the market risk premium, and this one is the minimum risk you would accept to invest in this company. It is usually compared to the 10-year treasury from the U.S. So the cost of equity for Johnson & Johnson would be as follows. Cost of equity equals 5.69% plus 0.63 times 2.33%. The cost of equity would equal 7.15%. Lastly, before we plug in our numbers, let's calculate next year's dividend based on our projected growth rate. The dividend 2017 for Johnson & Johnson was $3.36 times the growth rate of 4.33%, which would equal $3.51 for next year projected. Formula again is V equals DPS divided by R minus G. So plugging our numbers, the future dividend per share or DPS equals $3.51. Cost of equity or R, which we calculated earlier, equals 7.15%. G equals 4.33%. Therefore, the value of Johnson & Johnson would be $124.46. This shows, according to our formula, that Johnson & Johnson is currently priced at $132.89. It appears that Johnson & Johnson is overpriced according to our formula. Neat, huh? Let's try one more. Corning. Inputs for Corning are dividends equals 62 cents. The beta is 1.13. Future, first, the future dividend of Corning will be 
current dividend times the growth rate of the GDP. So we have 0.62 times 4.33%, which equals 0.026. Adding that to the current dividend of 0.62 gives us a future dividend of 0.65 cents. Next, the cost of equity will be cost of equity equals 5.69% plus 1.3 times 2.33%. The cost of equity will equal 8.32%. Now we can plug the numbers into our formula again. Future dividend per share divided by cost of equity minus the growth rate. 0.65 divided by 8.32% minus 4.33%. The value of corning would equal $16.29. The current price of Corning in the market is $30.45. This would possibly indicate that Corning is overvalued at this time. A note when doing these calculations, remember to always do it in a decimal form such as 0.04 for 4% and 0.0233 for 2.33%. This will help lead to more accuracy when doing your calculations.